Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to EVO Japan 2020. Here we are, day two, Makahari Messe, Chiba City, Japan. My name is Kuro Ken. I'm Chelsea. And here we are. We are ready for day two from 3,000 entrants all the way down to 700. Uh, we had quite a number of disqualifications, but never mind that. We had 3,000 cap. That's what's important. Yep. And, of course, day one, we already got the match set, ready to go. We have Shuton, Shuton being one of the best Olimar players, probably the best Olimar player Definitely. in the world from Fukuoka, Japan. We got Kombu on the two-player side playing Krom. And his name is Items, please. No, we got to ban that man. Not allowed. <laughs> Not allowed on the stream here. Items. I know that Pikmin definitely had that huge nerf, uh, and a lot of players did fall off of using Olimar earlier in the meta. Uh, it was the hitbox increase on the size of his head, so his head is now actually bigger. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Do you know the lore behind Shuton's name? I do not know. For, for Kuro? No, uh, no, actually. Oh, that's right. Kuro is a pro Japanese player here. Uh, he actually won the most recent Umebura, but uh, I believe he fell ill and was unable to attend oh, wow. uh, EVO Japan. And it was quite a serious illness, if I'm oh, not wow. mistaken, yeah. So we got over here, Kombu on this side with items, please. I think Kombu was one of the players who qualified for the Nintendo circuit here oh, in Japan. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that. And I, I think he was one of the gods with the items. Mm -hmm. So he actually went to the lab and practiced with the items. Where I see. Everyone else had no idea what the items were. You know what? I'm also guilty of that myself. I have no idea what yeah. the items do. But no, we need to ban this man. He would be too strong if it was the items. Already there. The quick back air, out of shield. With the quick parry too, such control, 99% though, and see the master play right there, throwing away the blue Pikmin because the blue Pikmin is strong with the grabs, throw it away, gonna use the high damaging Pikmin, probably wants to go for a white one here real soon. Here at the blast zone, throw away the Pikmin, don't need them, they're just dead weight anyway. Look at all those poor Pikmin, those souls. You gotta love the extra animations that went into the Pikmin <laughs> when they pass away. You can see the kind of like soul that <laughs> flies so, out. So sad. Was that another thing in Smash 4? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. And yeah. There, there was an excellent play. Just attack on the damage. The white Pikmin actually does oh. the most damage. It's the poison one. But you can see there that he threw the white Pikmin on Krom and actually hit him away. So when he's in hit stun, he's not actually able to uh, get the Pikmin off of him. So the damage just racks up real quick there. Krom with the strings here. Krom, really oh, fast character. this is a character. really bad position for Shuton. Yeah, he doesn't want to be off the ledge at all. Again, got to go back to neutral, but man, Krom with the speed, I could see how he could get in very easily, but Shuton, also an aggressive Olimar, be very difficult to get in. Especially since his grabs and such are increased, and also his hitboxes are increased in range because he throws out the Pikmin. All right here, trapping him on here at the edge. Almost sniped him with the purple Pikmin. I think that's going to be it there. Shuton with the quick two stock over Kombu. Yeah, you see uh, Krom, very, very fast character. Very, very strong, but he, is, he has one huge deficit, and that's the recovery. It is atrocious. It's yeah. very, very bad. And uh, uh, some players actually got to test Super Smash Bros. Ultimate before it came out, and uh, up Legitimately, might I add. I know there was a leak okay. there. Legitimately. <laughs> and uh, they were thinking that Krom was actually the worst character. Oh, like, really? Yeah, because of his recovery is so bad. And uh, the Krom side, the strategy of just doing the up B to smash the characters into the abyss was also nerfed. All right. It, it looks like Kombu might be switching it up. Okay. Switching up to Roy here. Okay, I think uh, this man might actually be excited about Byleth coming to Smash Brothers on Tuesday here. Definitely a huge Fire Emblem fan. Fire Emblem being quite popular here in Japan. All right, tacking on that red Pikmin right away. You know, I don't really see a lot of usage with the red Pikmin here. I mean, he, he, he tends to just kind of use the other Pikmin, throw the Pikmin, you know, get the damage where he can, but for the most part, just throw them away there. Oh, we got the lot oh, combo. good, good. Already 97%. Roy not being one of the, you know, the stronger characters according to the meta here. Also not one of the most popular characters, but again, the roster size is just absolutely massive. 
Okay, we finally got some damage here. 30% with just two swings. 44. Knocking him away here. I think anything at this point. He probably wants the blue Pikmin or the purple Pikmin lined up. Blue for the grab. Oh. We got the up smash real quick. Taking one stock there. And of course, up smash being very strong option. Covers both sides there. Both sides of Olimar. And again, you know, just having no projectiles is probably going to be a little bit difficult for Kombu here to get in on Shutone. Slapping him away. 79% almost lapping him percent here and is going to lap him as soon as I say that. Ah, just the... He's just going to have to pressure him, but again, every single time he gets close, his approach getting stuffed by the purple Pikmin there. Ooh, that's not good. No, definitely not. Not good. Here we go, getting thrown away here. What's the recovery? Covering it with the purple Pikmin. That was excellent. <gasps> and the dunk on him. Three stocking. Kombu, please, not like this. I know you want the items. You're going to have to win if you want the items. <laughs> Go to up B. Okay, that was good. 121% here. Able to get him with the forward tilt. Tries to go for it. Puts himself in, in a bad position. Oh, no, no, I can see what he's going for. He was probably going for a, a quick ender there with the up B, but gonna miss. Shuton able to shield that. Oh, no, he's actually working on the three stock. This yeah. is a disaster for Kombu. And oh. he's gonna get the three stock. And that was unfortunate. That was I know so unfortunate. I know oh everyone goodness. says unfortunate about the SDs, but that was just, uh, yeah. you don't want to go out like that. You know, Komba, a very strong player here in Japan, but you don't want to go out like that no matter what the game may be, what the matchup may be. Most, well, Kombu, maybe we'll get items next time. And congratulations to Shu Tom proceeding 2-0 yes, over Kombu. It was very strong. I would love to see him play with items. Oh, I think yeah. that like, nobody would know what to do. Um, you know, a lot of people dog on the items, but I think they're, they're actually, they can be quite hype, right? Just because of like the whole RNG factor. Also, all the different stages that are available. Right. All right. Well, Chelsea, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I'm going to switch out with Viram, uh, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. It was a Hello there, everyone. I apologize for that. I had underestimated how long it would take here to get here by train, but uh, I am back. Of course, I am Viram, and you already know Kuro Ken. Yes, it's another fantastic day. Evo Japan, day two. We just saw Shuton, three-stock Kombu. Ooh. Actually, I know Kombu, God with the items, but unfortunately there's no items here, <laughs> nowhere to run nope, from nope. Shuton. Not yeah. at all, especially especially if you're playing Krom and Roy, who aren't even like yeah. item specialist characters. You know, you mm -hmm. could kind of sort of have an item if you play someone like Rob or the Lynx, mm -hmm. but not when you're an honest swordsman like Roy and Krom. But coming up next, I believe we have... Uh, Karuegu versus Fua. Fua, yep. Uh, yes. Fua is very, very strong with the Marth in uh, the previous iteration. Yep. Smash 4. Uh, not breaking, you know, the top 20 or so here and with the ultimate, but still a very, very strong competitive play. We are in day two, after mm -hmm. all. After all those thousands of people dropping out of the tournament uh, yesterday, we're here at top 700. Looks like they're coming onto the stage right now. Yeah, so Marth in general in this game is definitely a uh, a character that's kind of, in this situation, overshadowed a lot of the time by Lucina, if just yeah. because the general pace of the game means that it's, it's a little bit harder to get those tippers comparative to Smash 4. You know, you don't have those same jab setups, for instance, that you had before. That said, though, Marth inherently, just because of his speed, his mobility, uh, the potential power behind his kit, Definitely still not a character that you can afford to sleep on by any means. I think that's that's almost uh, the same with like every character in this game. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like there's just so many matchups you don't you can't remember each one perfectly, and unless you're some sort of genius. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time, um, even at the top level, uh, at, at this point in the meta anyway, a lot of it comes down to there is a degree of matchup knowledge that is required, mm -hmm. but I think. It comes down to individual player interactions, how you're able to adapt to the specific habits yep. of your opponents in particular. And we did see with uh, such hyper adapters such as Renai previously mm. in Smash 4, sometimes you know some of these players, we saw with Kazunoko yesterday, kind of lose the first match, feel it out, and then just stomp for the remaining two matches. You know, We, we see that as well. Yeah, definitely. Of course, I'm also curious to see who uh, Fua's opponent, uh, Karoegu, is going to opt for in this set. Of course, 
As I mentioned before, we are up to day two, so a good majority of the entrants have been eliminated. So we are getting closer to the best of the best. But even then, we still have a lot of entrants remaining. So there are going mm -hmm. to be quite a lot of players who are lesser known throughout uh, Japan and worldwide. I'm ready for all unknown top eight. Mm -hmm. All unknown top eight. That <laughs> well, be, I mean, that, that's a tall order, but... That's a very tall order. <laughs> I, I'd be shocked if it happened, yeah. considering that pretty much all of the... Uh, Top talent that we know in Japan is in this top um, is in this bracket. You know, we have uh, every every Japanese PGR representative here except for uh, Ron and Kuro. Yes, and of course we have a good chunk of the Japanese PR here as well. We also have uh, Mr. E from uh, the West also proceeding through the bracket. Yep. Uh, so we might hopefully we see them on stream. Uh -oh. That would be an absolute pleasure. Particularly towards the um, the latter part of the day, I can I can suspect you know players of Mr. E's caliber will probably be able to make it that far, and I wouldn't be surprised if we did see uh, see him on stream later on in the day. But right now, of course, we do not have Mr. E's Lucina. We will be having uh, Fua's Marth. I, I'm I'm assuming that she is sticking with the Marth in this game. I mean, it is very possible it could stick to a different swordsman as well, right? That's Maybe true. Lucina. That's true. I mean, sometimes you know, when it comes to top play, you there's those people who are character loyalists and like, you know what, I just want to win. I want the best toolkit possible. Right? Yeah, that's very true. And you can't really dog either. All right, looks like we're heading on over to final destination. First thing here in the morning. Beginning with the end. I have to say, I really like this iteration of uh, Final Destination. And e with each iteration of Final Destination, I always say to myself, like, it just can't get any better. It can't get any better, but every single time, Nintendo outdoes it. Oh, looks like there might be some sort of uh, technicality here. Oh, no. Okay, they're getting ready. We have a Pichu. Pichu definitely also falling out of the meadow, right? After the nerfs. Yeah, definitely not as prevalent. Still mm. a pretty strong character, oh. but a, a character strong. who's... Yeah, very vulnerable, uh, reasonably fast, but not the fastest out there. So it's definitely possible to kind of play very kind of slow and defensive play, very campy versus the mm -hmm. character to prevent him or to prevent the character from really getting any momentum going and then just kind of with punishing in those sorts of instances. But Fua is indeed sticking with the Marth and Karo Ego, as you mentioned, with the Pichu. You know, I got to respect it. All right, here we go. Final destination, Pichu versus Marth. No, I think Marth would... Swordsman probably wouldn't have a problem with hitting such a small character like Pichu. Okay, we're going to rock the button check, of course. Mm. You know, the, a lot of the, the characters might have a difficult time with attacking Pichu just because of the small size of the hitbox. Yeah. But Marth does have uh, quite a few lo uh, large arcing attacks like that forward tilt, the forward air, back air as well, up air, just lots of big arcs on those attacks. But... The challenge, of course, will be securing those tipper hits versus a character that is so small as Pichu. Mm -hmm. And as mobile, too. Also, fun little fact about this particular costume of Pikachu, this uh, little spiky-eared one mm -hmm. is, uh, in the games, is guaranteed to always be female. Oh, okay. That's like a Pikachu with the heart tail. Yes. Okay, I see. Actually, that Pokemon, ah, man, I got to say, there, there's, there's so many Pokemon currently, and I've definitely fallen behind. <laughs> It is easy to fall behind with just how many there are and how many games there have been. Game Freak love to release that the main games of those series pretty much annually, which mm -hmm. is a lot to keep up with. Yeah, um, a lot I to keep up with for everybody, really. Oh, man, Fuwa ro rocking the white costume, the best one, hands down, not going to lie. It's very, very clean. But finally, we're off game one, final destination, Pichu versus Mark. And already Pichu just right out the floodgate, oh, starting with these lightning no, loops. Oh. Okay. All right. We cool. have the up B to just break out of those dangerous situations. We didn't want to see any Marvel combos this early in the morning. Frame one intangible, incredible pr pressure relief tool is that Dolphin Slash. All right, you can see here, you know, just trying to approach by using the neutral B, these el thunder jolts, electric jolts. But of course, uh, Pichu self damaging cannot be campy for too long or else they'll end up losing uh, the passive neutral. Yep. And you already see, as I mentioned before, Fua is just kind of, uh, both of these players are kind of taking it slow now after that rather 
Lightning fast start, but a great trump into the back air from Karoegu taking that first stock. Gonna have to hold in against Karoegu. Now that's just gonna be one more thing for Fua to worry about when at the ledge. Alright, there we go. The neutral air actually able to snipe out Pichu there. Can't really seem to get anything going though. Oh, oh here. No, luckily, pops out of the lightning loop. Oh, but here we go. The, the neutral B gonna be able to ride along the side of the wall. Gonna prevent Fua from recovering. Fua at the moment having a little bit of trouble just finding a really solid hit. Just trying to play this careful mid-range game. And again, oh. the Trump into back air. She has to look out for that. Karuego now with a two-stock lead versus Fua. You know, the golden rule, if your opponent is not going to do anything about it, you just keep abusing it. Mm -hmm. Fua going to have to adapt quickly. Keep doing it until it stops working. But there's always a great strategy to opt for. Unable to fully capitalize on the combo, but the pressure is still being mounted. Once again, able to recover. With the quick up throw, hoping maybe they couldn't have gotten the wrong DI, but no, Karo Egu is still living here. Yeah, Pichu, of course, very, very light, but as marked, it can be a hard, it can be rather difficult to secure that killing blow. And now, this is really falling out of Fua's favor. Another oh, drop into the thunder this time. What a finish from Karo Egu, a three stock coming out from him. I just feel, you know, Fua definitely had to get on top of these trumps. That was three for three. Yes. She definitely has to, um, she has to act faster off the ledge in those situations. Otherwise, she's going to have to deal with all of those trumps. And, you know, just overall, Karo Ego's approaches, you know, Fuo is just not able to stuff any of them. Just the speed of Pichu in comparison to Marth here. Uh, later on in the set, she was kind of using the down tilt to stuff the approaches, but if Karo Egu were to take to the skies and you use the neutral B there uh, to help cover the approach, then it felt like Fuwa was kind of lost there. Hmm. Now I'm wondering about the stage counter pick. Will Fuwa opt for somewhere with uh, more platforms in particular just to kind of shut down uh, shut down Pichu's avenues of approach, or will she run it back to Final Destination? Feels like it's going to be unlikely, considering how that game mm -hmm. one went. But um, it's a bit of a tricky choice. Like, I think Smashville was the pick. Yes, Smashville is the pick, and they're going to rock the same characters here. Sticking with the Marth, can respect it. Let's see how Fu was able to adapt to Karo Ego's strategies. Even with the, the the jab there, Pichu just being so quick out of shield, able to react and get quick 13% here. Not able to get any of the lightning loops though. The trickiest thing for Fua at the moment is that, yeah, there we go, acting off the ledge much faster this time, allowing her to avoid the trump. But the tricky thing for Fua at the moment is that she's having a hard time finding the proper range where she can uh, actually swing. It feels like she's getting whiff punished quite a bit by Karuegu, which is not quite characteristic of what you want to happen as Marth, but a great back air to catch her coming down from Karuegu right there. Another stock lead. Go able to get these straight hits, but not really ever to able to follow up either. Great, wow. Finally yeah. getting that triple neutral air, getting a nice early kill, and now Fua finally getting a stock on the board. A lot of uh, back and forth movement between these two players, both trying to look for an opportunity to create a real opening. Oh, again, back at the ledge. Let's see if is able to trap him. No, great recovery that time. I feel like uh, Fua needs to be a little bit more confident in her rising aerials. There we go. Try to intercept Karo Egu before he intercepts her. On the other hand, of course, being uh, a little bit too liberal with those rising aerials will uh, leave you being punished. Good down tilt. There's a little bit of an ambiguous recovery there. Not able to intercept that. Was going to recover on the left hand side. Oh no. Oh, able to actually block this time. Not much landing lag on that neutral air whatsoever. Good down tilt again. Not shielding at the ledge. Power Egg recovered with nice use of the quick up B out of shield there. Just to snipe that next stock off of Kato Egu. 
and I like that a lot. Uh, Fuwa kind of conditioned Karuegu to feel comfortable with those out immediate out of shield options. So she went for a down to on shield, which was very safe, allowing her to punish that out of shield attempt. Karuegu just off of the mark with these smashes at the ledge. Any one of those will spell Fuwa's demise if they connect. Great grab. Waits for the air dodge and gets it perfectly. Karuegu evening up the stocks once again. Perfect sequence there from Karuegu. But still has one stock here and Pichu being one of the lighter characters in this game. The lightest. Very, very fragile. A, a strong tipper at the ledge. Ooh, almost gets a tipper F smash right there. That would have been the game. Oh, but now Karuegu has find, found his opening. Unable to... Again, unable to get the lightning loop there. But big damage when needed. And the quick up B to close it out. Fuwa getting one point on the scoreboard. Coaxed Karuegu into believing that there was a whiff punish opportunity there, but just a little bit too little end lag on that down smash for him to get the punish. And so that up B will close out that game number two. Yeah, Karo Ego definitely getting a great amount of this percent on Fuwa from the whiff punishes or the landing lag. Mm -hmm. So I'm really liking that Fuwa is taking these risks with the up B as well. But now, of course, moving on to this game three, it is Karo Ego's counter pick advantage. And there are a lot of stages that Pichu would like to go to. We saw the final destination playing in his favor a lot in that game one. He also has a stage like Kalos, for instance, which works very much in his favor. I had missed the stage pick. I uh, did miss it as well. I mean, right if we one. go to Kados, I mean, I would assume that Fuwa would ban, would ban Kados. Mm. Just because of the walls there, I think that would be too much of a benefit for Pichu yeah. to let that go. Combination of, I believe, the wall jump and the jolts. Okay, we're going back to final destination again. I think Fuwa after that game too, probably feeling a little, bit, a little bit more confident in the way that she was playing or the way that she was approaching this matchup. And she's already off to a pretty strong start. All right, throwing out the aerials there. Okay, be more aggressive on the ledge as well, rather than just trying to go for the passive defensive option there. Even after whipping the full combo, Karuegu still able to punish the air dodge in. And look at this, now that Fuwa is opting for a lot more immediate get-up options off the ledge, Karu Ego is now going for fewer ledge trumps. He's kind of noticed, and I wonder how he'll be able to punish those incoming options off the ledge now. I also noticed that Fuwa really likes going for the ledge jump there, and almost, Karu Ego almost uh, sniped her out of it. Mm. Gonna have to be careful of that option there. Going for a trump once again. Probably thinking that she's gotten a little bit too comfortable with those ledge jumps. Maybe she's not going to go for another one. That time, not reading the air dodge and going for the immediate thunder. Karuego getting the first stock. That's a tap on the shield breaker there. Does not connect. Again, Karuego definitely getting aggressive with these ledge jumps. But it's Fuwa with the more immediate options. Very, very nice boost grab right there. And the combo afterwards. Precarious position for Fuwa. Ah, that, that forward tilt might have hit if it was actually aimed at the right way. It looks like that might have been an input error there. Very, very nice sequence all throughout that from Karuegu. I like the down smash as well, but finally taking the stock with that up throw. Pichu dying very early to that. Much earlier than most of the cast. And that, that grab is so quick, so difficult to DI. Once again, Fuwa has definitely caught on to these ledge trumps, acting immediately off the ledge and not allowing Karuegu to get any of these off. But still, this is quite the deficit for Fuwa. Let's see here. The options getting a little bit more aggressive as well. Lovely back air, sneaking that in between the aerials of Marth. And now Fuwa potentially on her final stock here. Again, getting aggressive, just having a difficult time hitting a Pichu's approach. It's... Once again, we, we see kind of a return to game one here. Fuwa uh, throwing out the aerials, but unfortunately, with not connecting, then Pichu coming in for the whiff punish. And it seems like Fuwa is struggling to land any type of hit here. That was close, landing right into the forward smash, though. Fuwa, unfortunately getting dropped out of this bracket.
Karu Egu taking it over for 2-1. Uh, yeah, there were a few instances uh, I noticed in game one, but right there at the end of game three, Fuel was going a little bit too high above the ledge with those recoveries, just misspacing them ever so slightly. And Karuego right at the end there was able to fully capitalize with that forward smash and taking a game three. With a great close set between those two. Even though game three was a game one was an incredibly dominant showing from Karuego, mm. the three stock coming out and making use of those ledge trumps. Fuwa was able to keep it very, very competitive up until the end right there. All right, up next we're going to have a Shogun versus Tepe. I think Shogun is uh, quite popular for his uh, theorizing. He's kind of like the theory lab monster of uh, the Japanese Smash scene, and uh, he plays Snake. Yes, yes. A very, very uh, fascinating Snake at that one. That was quite... Uh, quite a memorable set a little while ago between him and Samsora going to game five. It wasn't until um, I think Samsora like reverse 3 0 him, but that just kind of goes to show uh, the sort of technicality and the finesse that his Snake has. Um, I believe uh, Snake was his Brawl main all the way back in the day. I believe so. Yeah. yeah, and then he mained Fox in Smash 4, so a very, very different sort of character there, mm. but he's returning back to his, um, his roots with Snake in Ultimate. And I think that's sort of a trend with a lot of these snake mains uh, going yes. uh, going from Smash 4, from Brawl to Smash 4 to Ultimate. You know, they've um, players like MVD as well. You know, they had their um, a different character in Smash 4, mm -hmm. and then they're returning back to the snake because he just feels so familiar. Yes, exactly. I believe so too. And you know, just with the play the play styles as well, the trickery, and I'm yep. sure they just. They love using all the inputs. You got to press so many buttons. It's such hard work to play Snake. Yeah, everything just kind of clicked into place. A lot of the core gameplay elements mm -hmm. uh, remain the same. You know, those grenades, such a crucial part of how neutral is played. Uh, big, strong aerials, although very, very laggy. Mm -hmm. Very powerful ground, uh, very powerful and fast ground options that kind of lead into one another from the grenades. Yes. And just like, he's an incredibly unique character. Very very individual archetype among Smash, uh, Smash's cast. And, you know, when you've committed all that time to him, you can't help but feel attached to that sort of character. I mean, to be completely honest as well, if I put that much time into a single character, what, that is so different, as you mentioned, a different archetype than all the other characters from Smash Brothers. I would definitely would l love to see him come back and then mm. definitely stick to that character as well. Knowing that, you know, the technicality, you have to lab, you have to understand how your opponent's moving, and also be able to follow up, you know, with from the grenades, right? And be able to connect with those laggy aerials. Mm -hmm. Can't just throw them out willy-nilly or else you're just going to get punished for it. I can't help but remember um, the, the announcement for Smash Ultimate at EVO uh, last, year before last, EVO 2018, not EVO, um, E3. 2018, yes. where we got the Everyone Is Here trailer and Snake was the one that appeared. Oh, what a moment. What a moment that was. But Tepe coming through with the uh, Villager to combat the Snake. This is obviously going to be a very kind of uh, long-range game between these two. Lots of projectiles, slingshots versus grenades here on Smashville. Game one. I wonder how um, Tempe is going to be able to utilize the pocket here. You know, there's just so many different grenades, so many different projectiles coming at him. I assume it's going to be safe for something like a Nikita missile, but... Yeah, that's what here. my initial thought would be, particularly when uh, Tepe is off stage. Definitely wants to have a way to get around that villager. Having a very, very flexible recovery, but still... Oh, oh there it is. Good. Yep. The Oh, I love the coverage right there. Aiming that Nikita upwards just so that he could have a delayed option and then going for the forward tilt to knock him off stage once again. Tepe keeping this relatively close, but is at death percent to that mean up tilt from Snake. Can't get in too close. Oh, that's a laggy grab. We're gonna have to be careful with that one. Okay, the third time's a charm on that grab here, and that forward tilt is gonna close it out. Yeah, forward tilt fast enough to be able to get combos off of the down throw around 120, 130% if I recall correctly. And able to get the KO right there. Lovely recovery with the C4 going nice and high. Shogun recovering all the way back to center stage. Ah, I have to give a shout out to the Snakes. Using the grenade to get themselves out of these dangerous situations, you know, you might as well just take the percent if it's going to mean that, you know, saves your stock. Yes. Clever use here. 
Oh, we did not watch out for the C4 there. And it just feels like Tepe is having a really hard time just catching Shogun. Shogun being so, so clever with his movement, just not allowing Tepe to get a feel for anything at the moment. Shield and the grenade, they're able to get a quick 27%. You know, I think also that might be confusing Tepe is that, you know, when the grenade is there, he would kind of assume that 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 space there is locked and Snake would not be returning to it, neither would Shogun. But Shogun is definitely not afraid to take a grenade in the face as long as, as he gets the percent for it. All right, finally, Tepe finding that down smash and getting a stock on the board. But look how much damage has been tacked on 80% already so far. You know, trying to go for the back tech there. Does not read it, but rolls right into the clutches of Shogun and ended quickly with that up tilt. That up tilt is ridiculous. And that was what? so, so superb because he had the grenade at the ledge. And of course, that in of itself instills a level of fear. And we saw throughout that game just how adept Shogun was at converting off of those grenades. So Tepe felt the need to roll in. And in doing so, he fell right into the clutches of that up tilt. The scariest option of the bunch. Shogun is ranked 22, 22nd in Japan for a reason. Looks like we're going to be heading to Pokemon Stadium here. And Tepe, I'm not sure if we're going to see a character switch. No, going right back to Morabito. Going to run it back. Of course, this is a winner's final set of this pool, so whoever wins this will be going on to the next wave. At the beginning, it's just a war of attrition here. Both characters using their projectiles. Okay, it looks like we struck first blood with the close quarters combat. Another thing that you may notice about Shogun Snake in a lot of these kind of neutral, these more passive exchanges is that He's crouching quite a lot, and he's doing that so that he can more easily low profile those slingshot hits and weave his way in to kind of start his own offense. We also see him, of course, latching that C4 on, explodes it. Not enough to get the KO just yet, but still a lot of damage being tacked on. Impressive, the, the Shogun is just so knowledgeable and so used to the timing of the grenades. He's confident just picking up and running with it. Yeah, that is clearly the sign of a man who has many years of experience under his belt with this character. And if I'm not mistaken, it seems like Villager also going to be safe here. The platform's being a little bit higher. Won't be able to clip Villager. Villager is a little bit short there. If we do explode the C4 there on the platform, I believe it won't be able to clip Villager, by the way. Yeah, despite his big head, his herbox isn't quite big enough to uh, get caught by that. Careful of the axe there. Yeah, lots to be careful about for both players, really. Tepe now at a very, very slight deficit, but he's keeping this very close, very competitive. Nice weight at the ledge. Knew that the C4 wasn't going to hit him if he timed that correctly, but caught by the grab anyway, and losing that stock to the forward tilt once again. Oh, comboing into the up tilt from the C4. So much damage, and another C4. 71% tax on from about four or five hits. Tepe just barely able to survive with that down air there. Let's see if he could get anything set up, but no, gonna go right into the nades. Okay, able to capture the Nikita missile there. Hasn't been able to do anything with the pocketed projectiles just yet. What a difficult, just what a difficult arsenal of attacks to deal with. Nice ledge trump, no punishable ball. Okay, still able to get the down air. Very, very nice from Tepe. Shogun just hanging out a little bit too long on that ledge there. The C4, I, I didn't even see that it was planted there. It essentially nullified. Oh, he was going for something crazy <laughs> right there. And I actually like that at close quarters from uh, Tepe, making use of the uh, rising short hop there just to relieve that pressure, prevent Snake from uh, getting those hits that really threaten uh, Villager's stock at that point. I think Shogun also knowledgeable and wary of uh, just how quick Villager's jab can be. Mm. So kind of just staying just barely out of his distance there, his range. Oh, just dropping. That might have been a, a 
a little bit of a goof there, but maybe he thought he could get away from the bowling ball just in time. Yeah, just a little bit too slow on that uh, response, unfortunately, for Shogun. But again, Tepe keeping this very, very competitive, very, very close, even though there's so much to look out for, and Shogun's misdirection is so masterful. Tepe is doing a real good job keeping this close, but it's beginning to run away from him. It's beginning to elude him. He has to make some plays. Whenever he gets in and gets those nares, he's able to get a good amount of chip damage, but unfortunately falling straight into that up tilt. And of course, Shogun will be getting the victory and moving on to the next phase. I mean, what coverage there. There was a C4, also Nikita Missile to watch out for. So he could have possibly air dodged to the ledge, but you know, there was the threat of the C4 and ended up landing right above Snake, right into his up tilt. It's just yeah. so smart from Shogun, the coverage. It's so, so difficult to keep everything, to keep track of absolutely yes. everything that That's Snake it. is doing. The really, really good ones will draw your attention to something, maybe a grenade, grenades in particular, um, but then you lose track of a C4. And then suddenly, because of the position that you're in, Snake has racked up a ton of damage and it begins to snowball out of control. Yep. But great stuff once again to Shogun. We'll be back right after these ads. Make sure not to go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Evil Japan 2020 here with Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Day 2. My name is Crow Ken. And I am Viram, and what a great set we have coming up next. We have the number three in Japan, Ken, coming up versus Yaminabe, a little Mac player. I think it's going to be a really interesting match here. Yaminabe might have a difficult time keeping up with Sonic. Mm. Yeah, despite Little Mac's mm -hmm. speed, he's not as fast on the ground as Sonic. Although, once Mac, if Mac is able to get in, he does have the advantage in terms of that frame data, in terms of the buttons. But Mac is such a hot and cold character. If you're able to get the ball rolling, he is a destructive force. But a lot of the time, that does not happen. So I believe we can expect to see quite a patient match, a lot of uh, bait and switch here. Ken definitely wants Yaminabe to maybe whiff something or leave himself open and just go in for the damage and get out of there. Yes. Especially with the armor. Oh, okay, there we go. Especially with the armor moves that Yaminabe has in his arsenal. And it's so interesting seeing uh, Mac play in general because despite the speed of the character, the, the gameplay flow is generally quite slow. Yeah. It's, very, it's, it's very much like a boxer's pace. He wants to find his openings and take his time so that he can maximize on his damage when he finds it. Yamanabe off to a strong start so far, but once those openings happen, suddenly a big amount of damage is tacked on. And look at this off stage as Little oh. Mac. All that happened was he lost neutral once and he lost his stock for it. And Ken, you know, quite excelling in catching the ledge there. Whenever anyone tries to snap to the ledge, he's got that forward smash down, tilted, ready to go with the two frame. It's the parry, but Ken still able to break through. Lovely forward tilt right there, but it doesn't follow up after the clank. Yeah, I mean, if I. Yaminabe I mean, getting just caught on his way back to the stage here. Neutral's reset by Ken, definitely having an advantage in terms of the reads. Very, <laughs> very nice early side B, and Ken caught unawares, missing the tech. This could be a chance to get a big amount of percent on Sonic very early. Let's see how Yaminabe is going to use his meter here. Unfortunately, losing it quite quickly. Yeah, that jab having uh, only one or two active frames and not the best hitbox in the world. Rather unfortunate for a ground-based character like Little Max, and that is going to be the stop. Losing that side B, of course. Once you get hit once in the air out of that side B, you cannot use it again until you hit the ground. Just the evasiveness of Sonic, just being able to hit and run, and just giving Little Mac here such a difficult time. Yeah, hit and run is definitely the name of the game for Ken right here. Just the way that he's altering the timings, the way that he's playing around the platforms and around the corners. And then every now and then just kind of injecting stuff like a homing attack to just throw Yamanabe off any kind of rhythm that he's trying to establish. Lovely side B right there. Go here, we do have the KO punch ready to go. Will Yaminabe even get the chance to use it? Oh, there he had a, 
a great chance to punish, but unfortunately he just hesitated just a little bit too long and also loses his KO punch for that. Lovely forward tilt usage right there, but again, every single opening really, really hurts for Mac. Another high recovery, easily intercepted, and Ken will be taking that with a two-stop, uh, two-stop, yes. Just Ken, just being able to follow up and trap Yaminabe off the stage, and once Yaminabe got off the stage, that was it for mm. the stock. So he's definitely had to make uh, better use of that recovery there. But unfortunately, you know, little Mac, not the best, actually, probably one of the worst at recovering. Yes. Yeah, this is a particularly tough matchup for Mac in this game just because of the fact that that jab hitbox is so much worse than it was in Smash 4. Not being able to kind of brute force through uh, Sonic Spin Dash as easily means that you have to be a lot more precise with how you time those normals. And every time you miss that timing, it could spell disaster. Again here, just getting the guaranteed hits, getting out of there. But putting him in the corner though, go on the platform. You know, Sonic getting away real quick, doesn't want any of that. Very, very smart of Ken just to know when to never overextend. He never needs to feel, feels the need to overcommit. Just takes those, those hits where he gets them. Again, leaving it. Yaminabe constantly guessing with the homing attack and not throwing it out enough. You know, using it just to get the percent, but not enough for Yaminabe to get the read on it. Superb punish right there. Almost getting the KO. Oh, a crazy oh. side B right there. <laughs> Trying to maybe call out a jump or a, or a high spring, but another good forward smash. One of the things to note about Sonic's homing attack is that if it bounces off the ground and then lands, Sonic is put into a ton of lag afterwards. Good stuff to Yaminabe taking the first stock of this game. The extra breathing room of Town and City just allowing him to more easily react, prevent Ken from playing around the platforms, particularly in a transformation like this. Spin dash into forward air. Great follow up. Jet. All right, finding center stage again is Yamanabe. He needs to kind of maintain that center stage so that he's not put in these offstage situations and loses his stock just like that. Only 19% put on Ken. Again here, now we have the three platforms on the stage giving an advantage to Ken actually just to be able to get in, maybe use the platforms to his advantage to run away from a Little Mac here who can't really do much in the air. There we go again. Just get the damage. Get out of there. What are we going to see from Ken here? Just a return to the neutral. Good down tilt into the, into the Joel Haymaker. Great down smash right there. He doesn't have a jump, but great recovery from Ken. Kind of adjusting the timing of when he was going to air dodge to the ledge. Going low. Very, very nice. Oh, he's going to be... And Ken actually not getting anything off of that uh, up B there. I did really like the idea of that up B though. He was trying to catch Ken, potentially overextending with the follow-up. And had he caught him, he would have been able to take that stop right there. Another great uh, evasion of the homing attack, but not in the position to punish that time. Ooh, oh, that's a very risky side B. And now he's going to pr probably lose his stop for it. There it is. Such a big lead for Yamanabe. Forfeited right there. And now he's playing from behind once again. You know, and sometimes in those situations, you got to go for the something that the opponent would least expect, but Ken, completely comfortable and just sitting in shield. Not going to fall for that one. Ken has been one of the best in Japan for a very long time, for very good reason. He's definitely not one to fall for those sorts of tricks. Spot dodge there, but good wait. Punishing the up smash. Oh, I like the idea of the grab, but Little Max grab is an absolute travesty. Not gonna, not gonna connect at that range. Oh dear. Throw him a bone, Sakurai. Such a nice catch. Perhaps like a, a misplaced uh, up air there, allowing Yamanabe to just get a quick hit in. Now we're going to see perhaps Yaminabe start going for those forward tilts more often. If he could get out of the situation here, back onto the stage, and he does. That was a superb jolt haymaker, and suddenly this is basically an even game between these two. One solid, a couple of solid hits here and there for Yamanabe, and he can get the confirm into the KO punch. We see how tentative Ken is now playing. He doesn't want to get caught by that. If he's able to nullify that KO punch, suddenly he's back in the lead. 
We haven't seen any use of the KO punch this set. Let's see if he's going to be able to connect this time. But no, unfortunately, the spring got to knock him out of that KO punch. Yeah, just enough knockback on that spring to send him into tumble, losing that KO punch and losing that wild card. And now he has to play this very, very honestly, very, very close to the chest. And Ken is simply not allowing that to happen. Brave forward tilt, that's probably going to be it. Fantastic use of the counter, counter. And he kept his jump. What a genius recovery, but it's not going to be enough. Forward tilt, sealing the set for Ken, 2-0, but a great showing from both players nonetheless. Yamanabe definitely doing a great job hanging in there towards the latter part of that game too. It was really, really close. He had a lot of great plays towards the end as well. There was just a, a couple of points where he overextended, uh, forfeited that lead that he had in yes. game two. And I think that really kind of um, set the tone overall for the rest of the set. I mean, perhaps he's just one of those players that in those kind of desperate situations, he's willing to just gamble it all. And it's completely fine. But against a top player like Ken, who was comfortable in sitting in shield mm. the entire time, you know, just running away, shielding, you know, using the side B there. I think it was probably, you know, a little bit unfortunate that Ken, of course, was not going to fall for those tricks. Yeah. Mm. But and the one time that Yamanabe... Uh, was confident that Ken was just going to sit there and shield. He mm -hmm. attempted the grab and it missed because he was just oh, outside of the range. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky to deal with yes. in times like that. But of course, once again, good stuff to Ken. Moving on, next up, we'll have another winner's final set here in Wave 2 of Pools between Raito, uh, Thunder Gaming's Raito, and uh, Nain. Raito, of course, known as one of the, if not the best duck hunt player in the world. He's also been uh, dual maining, I believe, Banjo alongside that. You know, he does love the dog and the bear. And uh, probably one of the players with more, uh, Japanese players here with more uh, international presence as he yes. likes to travel abroad quite often in comparison to the other Japanese players. Yeah, he's been to the States multiple times. He's been to a bunch of other countries as well. He's even been to the UK as well. Um, last year, he went to the uh, Albion 4 in the UK uh, in July. So, as you mentioned, he has a lot of international experience. Uh, ranked 17th on this iteration of the PGR, 8th on the uh, Japanese power rankings. So, a real powerhouse in this country. That once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here at Evo Japan 2020. If you're wondering how long Smash is going to go, no worries. We're going to have 12 hours of continuous Smash content for all you, ladies and gentlemen, at sitting comfortably at home. All right, we got the top 700 players or so. By now, I'm I'm pretty sure a couple of pools have finished. But uh, we had this, we started with around the top 700 in the tournament, so we're going to see top tier quality of gameplay all day. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, tomorrow is Championship Sunday as well, where we'll be seeing the top eight players who make it. The finalists out of 3,000 players. Only eight will make it, and only one will win the entire thing tomorrow. Yeah, you can tune into that on the main EVO channel, twitch.tv slash EVO. We will be doing a uh, we will be doing Tekken 7 first, followed up by Smash Ultimate, and then concluding with Street Fighter 5. Smash Ultimate for you Smash fans at home will be at around about 12:30 p.m. Uh, Japanese time. That is, I want to say, uh, I can't do the maths very quickly in my head. So let's just get straight into this game. Raito versus Nain. Oh, actually, Raito just was just oh. telling me that they're gonna do a button check real oh, okay. quickly. Yep, you gotta. You gotta let him rock the button check. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yesterday we did see some controller interference from Raisin. I think it was uh, Raisin was the Joker player who was using the pro controller, and yes. uh, one of his buttons was just uh, refusing to work from time to time. Mm. Yeah, that was a real kind of tragedy in that mm. game three. That was such a good set otherwise, but. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's kind of one of the unfortunate realities mm -hmm. with the pro controller in general. Um, you know, at an event this large, it is susceptible to that wireless interference. Despite how good, I personally believe that controller is very good. It's no, very comfortable. I, uh, yes. It's got a lot of buttons. It's, it's a great controller overall. It's just that in these major events, you can fall victim to that mm -hmm. very rarely from time to time. And it's, it's a real shame when it happens. 
that's actually the first time that I've ever seen in person mm. uh, controller interference actually, you know, interfering with a match. Yeah. It almost makes uh, it almost makes me want to recommend like pro controller users have that GameCube controller on you yep. as a backup. You know, it may not be the most comfortable, it may not be the most uh, efficient for you, but you will be able to minimize uh, those those input problems, mm -hmm. and I think that will feel better in the grand scheme of things. But I have to say that the Pro Controller battery is insane. It just it lasts for ages. Yeah, yeah, that thing just lasts forever. It lasts for ages, and the the distance between uh, where it can connect to from consoles is crazy as well. Uh, I remember being able to input my Pro Controller from the kitchen at home while my Switch is upstairs in the... Uh, it's that far? It's very, very far. I mean, you know, up here in uh, Japan, I think the, the homes are a little bit smaller in size, yeah. so uh, having just one room, you know, I, I will never have that problem, I suppose, <laughs> but that's good for me. All right, looks like they're ready to get into it. Right uh, with the Duck Hunt pick and Nane using Roy. Is it nine? Three, two, nine. One, go. All right, going to Pokemon Stadium here. Immediately starting off with the can. That is the centerpiece yeah. of Duck Hunt's game of Raikou's gameplay in general. How well can he condition his opponent around that can as well as using the gunman to follow up from behind. But Nine already into uh, inf infiltrating that defense of Raikou's. Definitely finding the right space to get in there, but let's see if Raikou is quickly able to adapt to that. Already with the side B there. Throwing Just out the Frisbee. Look at all the vertical space that Raito was covering right there, making use of all three of Duck Hunt's projectiles. The gunman on the ground, the can on the platform, as well as the clay pigeon. Again, now we can already see the, the tide is starting to shift here. Yes. Now Nine having much more difficulty approaching, and we see Raito was already ready for the approach there with the grab. Fortunately, it was whiffed, but he was ready. But one critical thing that you have to keep in mind is that Duck Hunt is a character that can struggle to get those KOs at times. Despite the percent lead that he has, you could argue that it's a bit of an even game if Roy with max rage is able to get that sweet spot back air, that, that double edge dance, that forward tilt even at the ledge before Raito is able to find that KO blow. And there we go, we already saw Raito kind of just giving him the, the ledge back there, kind of afraid to challenge the up B, and rightfully so. Roy's uh, up B, definitely a dangerous tool at such high percent, and with that, all that rage. All right, Raito nonetheless able to get the stop with the can. Lovely follow up, and then using the can right there to try to follow up with the tech chase as well, but beautiful edge guard coming out from Nine. All right, placing the can there, and still in the fear. Let's see, another can coming out, trying to cover that vertical space, but Roy's jumping just a little bit higher than the can there, able to get back onto the stage. But even if you're not hitting the can in that position, what it does is that it forces uh, Nine and Roy down a certain path, down a certain avenue, which allows Raito to easily reactively cover that space. Right there, he tried to read a jump out the corner, wasn't able to get the full read, but still, all this control, all the power is in Raito's hands right at the moment. To control the, the behavior, able to get off a forward air from that Frisbee, leading into that stock there. Yeah, Nine was not able to do anything during that sequence. Finally gets a double edge dance and an opening. None of Raito's projectiles out on the field at the moment. Look at this pressure coming out from Nine. Finally, back to neutral. Can is overpass is going to be up to his own instinct to get back on stage here, but still able to follow up with the can. That was in the middle of the stage. And again! Oh, look at those follow-ups. The gunman into the, the aerial, the can, and another aerial. Raito is just so on point right now. Just look at all the pressure. Just the can being a presence right there applies all this passive pressure to the opponent. Great use of that up smash there. Trying to catch Nine on his way down, but Nine decided to fall back just a little bit to recover. Even when Nine is able to get these straight hits, just the can is just able to break him apart. Zirko so went deep with the up B, and nice air dodge to make it back to the ledge there. 
to avoid Roy's up B. And it feels like bit by bit, Nine is getting a feel for this matchup, feel for the way that he wants to try to tackle uh, Raito's defense, but still, Raito ever adaptive, and what a way to close out that game. Solid two-star coming out from Raito. Throw, yeah, that was excellent. Throwing out that down B there, right in front of Roy, and he went for the up tilt to try to cover a couple of options there and to get rid of the down B at the same time. But unfortunately, uh, Roy, uh, excuse me, uh, Raito able to dodge to the other side and finish off that last stock there. And something that was actually quite interesting throughout all of that game is the fact that um, Raito was able to just kind of persist with the way that he was executing his game plan because actually uh, Nine wasn't shielding all that much. He wasn't uh, yeah. holding shield for extended periods of time to defend against the arsenal of projectiles coming his way. And as a result, he just kept kind of uh, hammering him with all of those projectiles. Maybe later on in the set, if he begins to start shielding more, Raito could find openings with those grabs because I don't think we even saw a single grab coming out from Raito in that game. No, I don't think so either. There was an attempted grab to stuff uh, Nine's approach, but um, it was whipped. There we go. Nine getting in early, just attack on some extra damage there. Wants the platforms from yeah, time to time to get away, move around his cans. That's exactly what uh, Nine needs to do. Once he finds that opening, he needs to just keep harassing Raito, not allow him to set anything up that he wants to. Close down that gap and keep it closed. Oh, there we go. We're already seeing uh, Nine. I was going to say Nine shielding for a lot longer here, but already just directly running face first into the can there. Air dodge, just maybe trying to cover or run away from a forward, potential forward smash there. So far, generally a real strong start, much stronger start from Nine this time around. Right, so trying to retreat away, oh, but misses the tech versus the can. So unfortunate right there, and now suddenly that lead has gone with the wind. Definitely could see what he was going for. He went for that a B reversal. Neutral B there to try to stop out his recovery, but unfortunately going to run into the can, but luckily able to use the back air there to close out Raito stock before he got too much of a lead. Yeah, even the sour spot of that, uh, of that back air was enough. Boy off stage, really, really scary. The can working so well as the lead trap tool. Even hitting him from beneath the stage there because of the explosion and the expanded hurt box. Oh, so, so clever, using the shot from the can, the neutral B, to relieve the pressure, prevent Roy from throwing out the attack right there. We go, there we see some of that plat the platforms coming into play, able to run around the cans, but if he's going to hit the can directly in his face like that, he's going to take some damage for it. Ahari, 157%, but the side B at the edge of the stage, going to close out Raito's second stock, and we got nine in the lead. Yeah, Raito just trying to use that down tilt to cover multiple options, but he wasn't able to cover the full length of the roll, and Nine was able to blow him up for it. 173% on Roy. Is he able to capitalize? No, unfortunately not. Even stop game once again. 0% on both sides. But this, of course, is Nine's potentially, uh, potentially his final winner side stock if he's not able to uh, take out Raito here. Go the throw right into the can for the extra damage there. I really thought Nine would, was going to go for hitting the can out of his way to make a clear path for him to approach Raito there, but opted to go for the grab. So the down throw potentially trying to get a follow up from the can. That down throw was really good because it covered DI way into the can, but co he could cover DI in with the up air right there, as we saw. And Raito just able to get the can out in time before Nine could approach with that back air that could have possibly ended the stock. But that up air going to end the stock. Nine, unfortunately, dropping out here at Winners Finals, going to the loser's bracket. Raito taking it over him 2-0.
Yeah, he scared him into air dodging with that can, making it slowly approach up. The interesting thing is that that can wasn't going to cover the high recovery with the way that it was uh, covering, but it's easy to scare someone into that position regardless, and he had the air dodge covered beautifully with that up air. And it's just a lot of that set, very similar to the Shogun set that we saw earlier, yes. it just comes down to the control. These projectile zoner characters, these trappers, they're so good at controlling where they want you to go. So again, congratulations to Raito. Up next, we have Abadongo versus Tiger here. I know Abadongo being one of uh, the fan favorites mm. and also a uh, international presence as well, uh, sponsored by Shinobiism. Yeah, uh, Abadongo is definitely a, I feel like a worldwide fan favorite. Yes. It's not, not just here in Japan, but uh, around the world, he's definitely a, a player that people absolutely love to watch. His... Um, his, his Mewtwo in particular in Smash 4 was was a real treat, and of course he switched uh, to the Bayonetta, but he's just been known in general to be a multi-character specialist. You know, we saw in Smash 4 the Mewtwo, the MK, the uh, the Bayonetta in this game. We have the Palutena, uh, the Wario, and I want to say Inkling? No, that, yeah. was, that, was, that was Inkling early on, right? Yes, he yeah. did use an Inkling early on. And also, uh, I was, as I was previously mentioning, uh, actually yesterday, that uh, Abadango is actually one of the more popular content creators mm. here in Japan as well. Yes. So uh, he has quite the Japanese fan base. Uh, more than you would actually expect. Mm. And um, I got to say, for those of you at home, if you're definitely following the scene and maybe you're thinking about making the content, just do it. Start pumping out that content. It would Im help improve the scene, get more players into your scene as well. It would be great for everyone. Again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're still here. Winners finals, uh, day two, EVO Japan. Still got tons of more matches coming up. We've got Kamehameha also coming up, up next. So make sure you guys don't go anywhere. Yeah, but right now, Abadango versus Tiger. So much uh, top-level talent here in this Second round of pools. Abadango defaulting to the Wario. Tiger going for the Diddy Kong. Abadango ranked 24th on this iteration's PGR as well as 7th on the, the uh, Japanese power rankings. Okay, looks like they're going to go ahead and do the button check as well. Yeah, Abadango, I think... Uh, he became very popular. I can't remember the exact name of the tournament, but he was using Mewtwo, and uh, he kind of popular popularized the the footstool into the down B. Mm. Yes, Nair footstool down B. That's definitely uh, his kind of yes, very very powerful pattern combo in Smash Four. Not something that you see quite as much in this game, mainly because of how his uh, Mewtwo's neutral air was reworked in this game. That said, though, as we mentioned before, Abadango, quite the multi-character specialist throughout all of Smash 4 and throughout all of this game. He's been juggling a bunch of characters. Even back in the day, right near the beginning of Smash 4, he mm. was on that Pac-Man uh, in the early yes. days of Smash 4. Maybe nah. one of the yeah, the, one of the more dominant Pac-Mans, and I think uh, during that time he was one of the one of the only Pac-Mans that were really making any breaks into the scene yeah. at that time. All right, but we're going to go ahead and see the Wario and a Taiga with the Diddy Kong on Pokemon Stadium. Diddy Kong, definitely a character that you don't see nearly as much as in Smash 4, mainly because of the, I would say, the environment of the game. You know, Diddy Kong relied on his unique brand of oppressive pressure, but in the context of his game, his tools are not nearly as oppressive as they were before, and as a result, it's like, why pick Diddy unless you love the character? He's quite an investment. But Tiger off to a strong start, but a precarious but position. Unfortunate SD right there coming out from Tiger, extending a little bit too much off stage. Yeah, I think it was also that when Abba actually went and jumped up, uh, the, you know, the camera kind of moves away from the stage, and it's kind of difficult to get your footing from time to time. So that was an unfortunate mistake there for Tiger. Now we see Abadango, because of this lead, he's more than happy to kind of stick around the platforms, wait for Tiger to come to him to create an opening. We're going to follow up with that. The, the long-lasting hitbox on that. Again, being very patient. There we go. Gets the first up air, and look at all that damage tacked on. 
He's just trying to kind of fish for this up air, deal as much damage as he can. And look at the way that he's also playing around the banana. He's making use of that neutral B to eat the banana, heal a little, and charge that waft ever so slightly as well, all in the process. Taigai doing a great job on changing the way he approaches and staying away from Abadango and walling him out when Abadango tries to approach here. And it's going to be the name of the game here. Just attack on the damage to get that stock. He's already at a deficit. And it's crazy to think that actually, um, had it not been for that SD, Tiger would probably have quite the noteworthy lead at the moment, but the waft is fully, fully charged for Abadango. He's probably going to want to take this stock before expending that waft. Let's see if Tiger even gives him that opportunity. Definitely that down there. They're a little bit deceiving. Thought the lag would just be a little bit longer there. Unfortunately, with that up smash, gets punished for his troubles. Love the use of the banana into the forward tilt. That move so, so powerful. And now a 3-1 to one stock lead for Abadango. Mm, monkey flip. Not enough just yet. Wario, one of the heavier characters in the game. Oh, monkey flip kick. Just barreling through all of that. Almost getting the KO versus Abadango. And again, this is another one of the issues of Diddy Kong. He does have a little bit of a hard time getting those KOs. And when you're taking all that damage from up airs, can be rather brutal. Finally finds it with that singular back air right there. But good job from Abadango saving the waft there to be able to use it in this stock. It's not enough damage. Hasn't gotten the right opportunity yet. Yeah, he's probably going to be looking for something like a late up tilt. Maybe an up air if he's able to combo it across the platforms. And now the confirms into waft are getting a little bit more tricky. Okay, one other thing that we may see from the waft is we may just see it being used as a raw read, maybe at the ledge, but even off the bike, the extended hit lag, the hit freeze helping to extend the hitbox of that, uh, extend the duration of the hitbox of that waft. And that was so smart. Mm. That's something that you see quite often at the ledge from Wario players. Yes. You know, they'll throw the bike up or throw it down and then use the waft to try to cover multiple options at once. But not often that you see that just center stage used like that so aggressively. Excellent stuff from Abadango right there. But of course, we cannot uh, forget about that SD that happened right near the start of game one for Tiger. Maybe the tide will turn, maybe. Uh, Fortune favors the brave. Yo, we already got 53% here. Abadango being quite aggressive in his approach. Not letting Tiger breathe at all. Here we go, Tiger now able to create some distance between himself and Abadango. Just getting away, barely enough to just pull the banana, but Abadango getting ready for it here. Such yes. moves, the, like such as a down tilt, that help you to, uh, excuse me, the opponent forces them to restand. Mm. It's a little bit difficult situation to react to as well. Yes, definitely. Doesn't get the banana into the dash attack. And it's so interesting watching Abadango kind of play around the banana. It's a mix of very, very slow, methodical waiting for Tiger to throw the banana and then sometimes just kind of injecting a little bit more pace so that he's like, okay, if you're not going to throw the banana, I'm just going to hit you. And I'm really liking that uh, Abadango will actually make use of the banana. Up until now, we haven't seen a lot of players, you know, making use of the bananas. And the bananas is just like, you know, win neutral for free in some cases, depending on your character. So definitely a powerful tool, especially if you have it in your hand. Yeah, very, very much so. Gets a downslip to the dash attack, but doesn't get the full, the, the sweet spot of the dash attack. Bike on stage, scary position for Abadango, but he makes it back and gets the reverse edge guard as well. Beautiful stuff. Tiger just going a little bit too ham on that one. Back in here, but here comes the combo. 40%. Ooh, and he even used the peanut to extend that combo as well. Very, very nice. Oh, he oh. gets the up air into the waft. Waft fully charged just at the right moment. Able to recognize that so quickly, too. Very impressive. But Tiger answering right back. Taking away a stock. See if he can clear this depth hit. Unable to connect that down air there. I'm going to see a complete reset back into neutral. Good up smash out of shield. How is he going to shock the landing? 
Like on a stage, almost ready with that bite there. Mm. Just a little bit off on the spacing. He had the right idea though. Again, throwing the bike, make sure it doesn't become a problem here. And he's just using, just continuously throwing the bike off uh, towards the corners of the stage, on, across the stage, to apply all this pressure to Tiger. He was able to tack a ton of damage on thanks to that. Now, of course, Abadango once again with the banana in hand. That's going to be a big punish. Good. Yes, it is. Unfortunate for Tiger to pick up the bike right there, leave himself completely vulnerable, and that'll be a 2-0 to Abadango. Yeah, I think uh, once again, you know, just a half waff there, just charging in, in just in time for him to be able to utilize that. Mm. Yeah, that half waft is it's very interesting because the power of that move actually varies gradually over time. Uh, the strongest point of waft is actually, uh, knockback-wise, is actually not the full charge. It's just before the full charge. And there are a few moves in the game that yeah. like that, actually. I think previously it was uh, Donkey Kong's the uh, neutral wind. B. Yeah, the yes. nine winds for neutral B, uh, Ike's eruption, uh, Roy's flare blade, a couple other moves like that. But next up, we do have Kamame coming up to the stage versus Ryoga. Kamame, of course, 11th on the current PGR, one of Japan's best yet again, second on their power rankings just below Zakre, and the Mega Man extraordinaire, another Wario player as well, and just. A man of many talents, a man of many characters. I believe he did win. Was did he win Evo? Or was he second at Evo a few years back? I he believe, was. Uh, he was second at Evo second. a couple of years back in Smash yes. Four. Um, he did, of course, win Umeboro Japan Major last year. Yes, that was the big tournament that is under his belt. Definitely a force to be reckoned with here. Let's see which. Pretty sure he's going to go with a Rockman pick here, but. Again, uh, with many top players here having multiple characters in their pocket, you never know. Yeah, of course, we have seen uh, the Wario in particular come out a lot from Kamame. Um, I know in Smash 4, he also had the secondary Sheik. I feel like yes. he's dabbled with Sheik a little bit in this game, but um, Sheik not quite the force, another character who was not quite the force that she was in Smash 4. Just a character that has to work very, very hard yes. in order to get a, a lot of a lot of stuff going. Yeah, it'll get get you know work so hard just to get the damage, and then unfortunately not having enough power to kind of end the stock easily. You definitely have to work for that stock as well. Yeah, have to work for that stock as well as uh, not having the best hitboxes to contest mm -hmm. other characters. You know, some of her moves are like negatively disjointed. That neutral air, for instance, mm -hmm. it tends to lose out or trade with other moves. And as Sheik who doesn't do much damage per hit, you don't want to be trading. No, no. When you're a light character that doesn't have high damage per hit, trades are not a good not a good situation for you at all. Oh, I think they're definitely going to go into the button check here. They're just talking to each other here. Mm. And up next, it looks like we have... Uh, we got Edge, very confusing name. It says Etsuji there, yeah. but uh, we got Edge here. We got Ikaboze coming up next. Right after Kameme and Yoga. Uh, I'm sorry, his sponsor is R2G. Hmm. I'm, uh, I'm unfamiliar with them, but okay, looks like we got the Wario and the Palutena here. I believe it's going to be a button check, but. Yep, goes right into the button check. Uh, I think Wario was definitely one of those characters. <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, that I forgot kind of existed in Smash 4 just because the character was just so rarely used. And uh, now in Ultimate, you know, he could, he's definitely a force to be reckoned with. And uh, earlier, much of it, we saw, you know, top players like Tweak, for example, using Wario. And a lot of players think that Wario might have been the strongest character at that point, especially mm. earlier on in the game's lifespan. Yeah, outside of um, Gluttony back in yes. Smash 4 in Europe, who was ranked number two in Europe at the end of Smash 4, um, there weren't, there wasn't too much worldwide representation for um, Wario, but now, of course, in this game, the character is an incredibly abundant force at top level. You've got Tweaks, you've got uh, Kamames, you've got Abadangos, you've got Glutonies. There's so much Wario going around now. Character is very, very terrifying in this game. But speaking of another character who is very much a presence at high and top level, of course, we have Palutena. Very incredibly well-rounded, uh, 
force in this Karameta. With the amazing aerial moves, especially that back in the neutral. Back air, forward air, back, uh, neutral air, as well as kind of like that invincible dash attack, long range projectiles, a good, uh, uh, an excellent grab and good throws. The character has so much at her disposal, but so does Wario. Let's see how come Mei Mei is going to combat this. For a bite there. The get up attack, unfortunately, not being the answer to that situation. Gets hit back off. Gonna be able to get back on. No, still uh, living at the ledge here. Mm, these retreating nares from Abadango as well as Abadango from Kamame, as well as these fares, are just doing so much to keep Ryoga pinned in the corner. But finally, Ryoga relieves some pressure and gets a combo of his own. Suddenly now, the game is even thanks to that barrage of neutral airs coming out from Palatena. Drake here, keeping the pressure on with the bike. Gets thrown off for his troubles, though. That platform there, make it, makes it a little bit difficult for characters to get back on the stage, but gonna take a back air right to the face. Palutena losing that first off. Yeah, lovely call out from the jump from Kamame right there. Jumping such a common option among uh, mid and high level players in particular. It's always the option that you kind of got to watch out for. Great use of that bike there to make that recovery more ambiguous. Coming down from the top, a little bit more difficult to see which way the character's moving. Lovely recovery onto that platform. Keeping all his options available. Back throw, not going to be enough just yet. The large blast zones and the heavyweight of Wario. Oh, late up tilt. He doesn't get the waft afterwards. He doesn't go for it. I think he wants to save it here. No, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, try to use it there, but unfortunately, Missing out on that one and the waft goes wasted. Yeah, he tried to get the two frame right there. Back throw, still not enough. Not from that position on the stage. Tries to get the up air for the chase. All right, up, uh, Kamame working his way out the corner. Jab again, still not enough, but the bike is on stage. Finally getting the KO with that Nair, just shy of 200%, 93% tack onto Ryoga. Tries to go for the jump read once again. Yeah, we're seeing it. He just keeps trying to go for this jump read, but uh, Ryoga has kind of caught on, and now Kamame's probably going to try to go for the lower the lower recovery edge guard. It looks like he was trying to go for the just the quick forward tilt, but this bite might be able to seal it out, and Ooh, it is. Oh, that was so, so clever, just pressuring, on, pressuring him on the platform with that chomp. Such a scary situation to be in versus the character like Wario. Great narrow out of shield, though. Tries to cover the jump in there. And eats 44%. Beautiful tech chase right there on the platform. Forcing him down onto that knockdown situation. And then just covering multiple options with that waft to the half charge. Very, very nice. And of course, uh, considering what happened in the previous stock, I feel like Ryoga right there was scared to roll away because he probably thought, oh, Chomp is going to get me in this situation and I'm not going to be able to avoid it. So instead he rolls in and takes the waft. Yeah, especially when you have to recover on those platforms. This almost certainly spells Doom up against the top player because they're able to throw options that cover a great amount of those ledges. Yes. All right. Wario, but it seems like Ryoga is going for a character switch to Wolf this time. Maybe wanting that extra aerial mobility to contest Wario air to air. And Wario's hitboxes uh, in the air generally regarded as not quite as good as Wolf's, which is going to be so crucial considering that these two characters both have the same max airspeed as well. Those air to air interactions are going to be so key. Already able to follow up there. Let's see if he's gonna challenge him into air. And yes, he is. There we go. Uh, Wario or Kamei tried to get, uh, approach with the neutral air, get out of that corner there. But Wolf stuffing it out with his forward, his very own forward air. Ryoga doing a good job so far, remaining nimble, getting these forward airs.
And I'm really liking the general spacing around Kamame Shield coming out from Ryoga as well. And if he's able to run away, then he gets hit by the blaster. And Wolf's blaster being no joke. That thing is beastly. Excellent uh, catch right there with the back air. Ryoga now off to a good lead in this uh, in this game too. Looks like the Wolf switch is working out for him currently. Yeah, Kamame has had a had a hard time landing kind of any longer punishes. Gets the parry right there, but no follow up afterwards. Beautiful drop down through the platform. I feel like that Nair would have been able to contest the up tilt had he gone for it. So instead goes for the drop down up air to continue the juggle. So now, now we see Ryoga kind of going for those punishable moves on shield here. And Kameme reacting and punishing quickly. Able to attack on that quick percent. Shifted momentum back in his favor. Just winning out these small exchanges here. Very excellent parry right there. Again, wasn't able to get the sweet spot of that dash attack. Excellent parry, and this time just goes for the dash attack. Straight up, Waft is fully charged, and only 68% on Kamame right now. So we, we saw the switch from Ryoga to Wolf to have a little bit more you know, power and win it out over in the air, but now we're seeing Kamame switching his strategy here to parry and then winning the small interactions just to get that quick percent. So one thing that Komeme has been doing, uh, he's been trying to kind of funnel Ryoga to play near the bike just so that he can kind of uh, mess up his own offense, mess up the timing of a lot of things. Oh, that was a very brave up smash. Ooh, good idea on the tech chase, but he wasn't able to get the, the up tilt off there. That probably would have been the stock if it connected. Lovely chase down with that up air. And now Ryoga, pretty much a full stop lead, but you cannot really call this a lead versus a character like Wario who has that waft on deck. We might see Kamebe here try to go for that late up air just to even up the stocks here. Oh, goes for the chomp. Just to get some of that percent back while tacking on some on Ryoga. This is fantastic wolf gameplay coming out from Ryoga right now. Good recovery with the Wolf Flash. A good trade for Kamame right there. He's looking just for that major exchange. Good read on that spot dodge as well. And Wait a now. lovely down air. He still has Waft intact. 69%. All he needs is one solid opening in the right position. And he could potentially take the set right here, right now. You know Ryoga knows that as well, so he's staying very, very patient. He does not want to commit to anything. Finally gets the up air. Go get it in these situations here. Ryoga has to take care not to panic. Air dodge at the wrong time here. Lovely landing with the forward air into that combo, and now the gap is gradually closing bit by bit. A whiff forward tilt doesn't go for the committed uh, tech chase. The yeah, upbeat. Missing out on that grab there, now off of the stage. Ryoga in the advantage state. Gonna go right back to the neutral though. Gonna have to be careful here. And you know that Ryoga is looking for those big jumps. He wants to call one out with that back air that will seal the stop him. But instead, Kamame lands on top of him and gives him the waft. Excellent stuff to Kamame right there. Remaining composed, remaining vigilant, and taking that set 2-0 over Ryoga. Ryoga, that game was definitely in Ryoga's favor there, but just getting a little bit aggressive there, wanting to close out that final stock, chasing Wario down. Unfortunately, going to meet him with the waft instead. Yeah, closing and, it out. And we saw in those previous two stocks mm. that those chase downs, those aerial chase downs, were working so well yeah. in Ryoga's favor. So Kamame knew that one of those was going to happen. He knew that he was going to try to aggressively press his advantage there, and he had the answer in store ready. I mean, just such an excellent play on him, you know, just losing it out entire match and then suddenly in one second shifting it 180 in his favor. Mm. Coming up next, we have uh, Railroads Gaming's Etsuji Edge, uh, Edge versus Edge versus uh, Ika Boze. Ika Boze. All right. Edge, of course, uh, Lucina main in this game. Uh, used Diddy Kong back in Smash 4. Definitely a uh, 
player who's been in the scene for a very, very long time, if I recall correctly. And again, just another one of these very established veteran Japanese players. Very, very capable, very, very talented. Currently uh, ranked 34th on the PGR and 19th on the Japanese power rankings. And just in general, being a part of the, the top 30, I would say, mm -hmm. for Japan is no joke. That kind of le overall overall level of play at that point is incredibly high. You know, just to take into the fact that the number of participants for the tournaments, you know, we do have a few majors here, but, you know, the one being, you know, Umebura, I think that's the one that everyone refers to. Mm. And uh, just, yeah, to be able to, to enter the top 30 out of that number of participants, like we're seeing here at EVO Japan, and how quickly the tournament fills up. So, you know, not only do you have to, you know, win your matches at the tournament, you actually have to be able to sign up before it gets capped as well. Yep. And we're seeing today that the, uh, the, the venue is actually a lot more packed today uh, just because we got some top eight games going on here at EVO Japan 2020. Also, it is a Saturday. Yesterday uh, was Friday, and it's a little bit more difficult to take time off here in Japan. Mm -hmm. So we, we saw the venue. Uh, it was still packed yesterday, but today is especially packed with the, the crowd watching top eight, watching the other games going on. We also have, like, the BYOC. Bring your own console or controller. I'm not exactly sure what... What it stands for? It's controller? Yeah, it's pretty much always bring your own controller. Okay, this is the first time we're actually seeing it, I think, at a Japanese event. I, I'm actually not familiar with this, but I heard it's a common thing in, in, in stateside. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's see if we're going to... Yep, we're going to go right into the butt check here. So it's, it's kind of great. You know, they do provide the monitors and the power, but it's, people have to bring their own setups. So we're seeing a lot of people uh, play the, the free games as well, casuals on the side. I believe we have a 64, 68 side tournaments. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, and that's uh, that's an insane amount. It, it has mm. everything. It has like you know even cell phone games. They brought uh, arcade machines here. That is quite wild. Nico Bose coming out with the Rob. Oh, that's that's my man. The robot. Everyone says he's soulless, but they don't know the truth. They're just cowards. <laughs> They're cowards. You can't look at that. That, uh, that <laughs> render on the character select screen and tell me that that character is soulless. He's here to have a great time. Look at him. <laughs> exactly. He's having a grand old time in this game, Smash Ultimate. The other two renders, they were all kind of like all business. You know, he was he was just there, static posed, ready for whatever. This Maybe one, he's definitely flexed. Look having, at that. He, he's, <laughs> he was inspired by Donkey Kong from Smash 4 and he was like, I'm going to do that. But of course, Start, start of the set, Edge versus Ikaboze. Here we go, already getting the grabs, keeping them off the stage here, yep. Uh, with with uh, Edge G playing Lucina, going to have a little bit of that, you know, just a vertical recovery there with that Dolphin Slash, but uh, going to be, gonna, just going to have to be careful of the, the gyro on the ledge there. Let's see how uh, Ikaboze is going to be utilize these Edge Traps. Lovely forward smash right there, not allowing him to take that ledge for free. Tries to combat the neutral air right there, just a little bit off on the spacing. Great shielding already coming from Edge, just to block all the incoming projectiles from Rob. Lovely roll in right there, just to avoid that dash grab. Get that edge, real tricky to work around a lot of the time. A lot of back and forth exchanges versus these two. Pretty much an even game. Stage control is in the favor of HG. Able to make it back. Takes a neutral air to the faces. And does a neutral air of his own just to knock Robot off. But thanks to that recovery, makes it a little bit more ambiguous. Recovering very, very high Ikaboze. He tries to go for the deep dive there. Getting caught halfway by Edge. You have to be careful when recovering in those positions versus Lucina. She has these big fast disjointed aerials that are really, really hard to contest. And so good at capitalizing on those edge guards. Excellent pull out on that gets attack with the back air. Quick punish, evening up this game real quick. Ikaboze. No, very interesting to, to 
Yeah, I see this Rob actually go for the, the back throw there, just to keep the pressure on. Yeah, you definitely see that sometimes from Rob, uh, just going for that forward throw, that back throw in the corner, just to maintain stage control, use the gyro to apply pressure immediately afterwards, because both those throws have quite low, uh, quite low lag, even though you can't combo off of them directly. Oh, and we see uh, Rob size definitely not paying him any favors here. Mm. And as you just currently on the attack with these Lucina aerials, relentless, not allowing Ikaboze to properly, uh, properly reset to neutral, finally managing to do so. And now he is the one with the corner control. But a great up smash out of shield versus the Dancing Blade. Not going to be enough just yet. Lucina barely hanging on. Going for that risky forward smash just to end the stock real quick, but gets punished for its troubles here. Messi tries to air dodge, but no dice. What's he gonna do here? He's gonna go back to the high recovery. Wow, that was very interesting air dodge, thinking that uh, maybe Edge was gonna chase him down there. Oh, such a quick match. Excellent mash out of that grab. Make sure to air dodge down as well, just to avoid any kind of follow up. Boys, the Edge guard for now. Doesn't get hit by the down smash either. Good stuff to Edge to do so far. Try to cover. Oh, I think that was an uh, accidental uh, air, dodge air dodge there. Yeah. He just wanted to end it and use the side B there. Great use of the up airs, even if it's that deep, just to ensure that Edge couldn't chase him. For easy damage and an easy gimp. Lovely combo right there. And continuing this pressure in the corner. 52% just by isolating him there. Great use of the down air right there. Doesn't get the follow-up though. Good get-up attack to relieve the pressure. And I, I know at this point, once again, Edge is going to be looking for that high edge guard. He's going to be looking for an opportunity to get that back air. But a good nair back down once again from Ikaboze. We haven't been seeing that for the last couple times, but staying on the lead for just a little bit too long gets spiked for his troubles. Yeah, that re-grab easily punishable by any character in the game, really. Loving this pressure coming out from Ikaboze now, turning up the pace, not able to get the Nair one into the forward smash. I don't think that would have been the, the game right there just because of how far it would have been. The Dolphin Slash actually sends him the wrong way. Ikaboze lives another day, but that one is going to send him the correct direction. Ikaboze, unfortunately, going down 1 0 edge with the one point there. Very, very nice pressure overall from uh, Edge Lucina. I feel like I feel like the Japanese Lucinas in particular just play the character so so fast and so aggressively comparative to um, their international counterparts. It's actually very interesting to see just because of the legacy that Japan has kind of built up over the years, being very kind of methodical, yeah. being uh, methodical and creative, I would say, versus. Um, the US in particular, much more aggressive and fast paced in their gameplay. But it feels like with certain players, the reverse is true as well. Uh, we do sh have our fair share of uh, aggressive players, most notably Shuton yeah. being quite, quite aggressive. Shuton very, very aggressive with Olimar of all characters, not exactly the first uh, character that comes to mind when you think aggressive Go! gameplay. Yep. But here on Lilac Cruise, we have game two. You know, Edge versus Ikaboze. We we have not seen this stage very often uh, during this uh, entire Evo Japan, I would say. You know, that's uh, not all that surprising. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> don't like this stage. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan, but the music is pretty good. Corneria can't, can't go wrong with the Star Fox music. Love very solid tracks. Using the gyro to just space uh, Edge just a little bit there. We we'll want to tack on that extra percent. We go. We saw a lot of uh, a lot of Ikabose coming down from center stage, but right there, opting to go a little bit uh, near, closer to the ledge there, mixing up edge. Great recovery. I was gonna recover this time. I'm just gonna go back to the center. Oh, I'm not sure. That must have been a missing put there. Mm. Maybe going for a laser off of the ledge, but unfortunately, gonna lose a stock there. Yeah, not good, Diana back here either. And now, Edge with quite a notable lead. And these platforms actually really helping out Edge in terms of his pressure, despite the fact that this was uh, Ikaboze's counterpick. It's really, really hard to, to deal with Lucina's sword. 
dealing with the Falchion across those platforms. It just covers so much space so quickly. Especially with uh, Lucina, just how fast she is. You know, you just could get under the platform, make her safe from any aerial approach there, mm. and then just use the, you know, the arcing up tilt. We'll try to read a tech yep. roll in with that down smash, try to get a KO right there, but Ikaboze not biting. There we go, we saw earlier when Edge was punished for that side B. That was so, so smart, just kind of applying offensive pressure by using shield. It's such a high level tactic that really, really good players use. When you have all that offensive momentum, using shield in that position just allows you to kind of really control the pace. Very nice down smash though coming out from Ikaboza. He is not out of the count just yet, using that to relieve that pressure and get that KO. Go. Lovely neutral air once again. We're in an edge guard situation. Great use of the, the down air there to cover the multiple options, but already with the up smash, great conversion there. Oh, that was nice. The Nair one into the run up up smash. That was such a clean finish coming out from Edge right there. And he will be moving on. Once again, that was another winner's final set of these round two pools. So Edge maintaining his side on the winner's bracket. So far, it does feel like a lot of these sets are playing out probably how a lot of our viewers at home would probably expect them to. You know, a lot of these known Japanese players are the ones that are making it through the winner's side of things. Mm. They are the ones getting these 2-0 victories as well. But of course, we have another ad break coming up, so make sure to stay tuned. See you soon.